Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Masser of Bloomberg Business Week Radio and TV, and I'm delighted to bring in Kathy Wood. She's the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of ARC Investment LLC. She is someone who is well known to our audience. Her consistent performance since she started ARC about seven years ago has certainly given her a lot of notoriety. Kathy, first of all, thank you for joining us. I know it's a crazy day. We're all watching the markets. We're all watching Bitcoin in a big way. The crypto market is coming undone. Last trade was about 35000 on Bitcoin. What's happening right now and how low do you think it can go? Well, I think we're in a risk-off period, and uh, for for all assets, if you if you look at the the stock market, the the more risky or volatile parts of the market have come in dramatically since mid. February. And I think a lot of the concerns have been around inflation. Initially, that was helping Bitcoin uh, because obviously Bitcoin is a very important inflation hedge. You know, it's a it's a rules based monetary policy, the first global rules based monetary policy we have ever had. Hugely important reserve currency of the crypto asset ecosystem. Uh, but I think uh, what's happening right now is because the stock market, the highly volatile part of the stock market, the innovation oriented part of the stock market has gone through such a correction, which has been flamed by inflation fears. Uh, I think I think the correlations uh, among volatile assets are going to one right now, and that's including Bitcoin. Well, I want to unpack a couple of things. So Bitcoin, I mean, you at one point, I think back in April, told Dow Jones that it could go to about $500,000. Do you still hold that target? Do you still think that's where we're headed? I, I, we do. I do. Yasin El Mandra is our uh, crypto analyst, and and uh, we we go through soul searching times like this and and scrape the models. And yes, our conviction is as high. The one thing that has changed here, however, is the environmental concerns around uh, Bitcoin, in particular, have mm -hmm. uh, caused. Uh, people like Elon Musk to pull away and say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! Let let me let me make sure I understand this." And uh, we believe that even this is going to change because, first of all, right now uh, the percentage of Bitcoin mined with renewables and hydroelectric power is quite substantial. I think in uh, China it's over 50 percent in renewables. Uh, and we also believe, uh, uh, and we wrote a paper. Uh, in conjunction with Square on this, and we're going to have a conference about it in July. We believe that Bitcoin mining integrated into the distributed grid, and by that I mean solar roofs, power walls in homes, uh, utilities, merchant power producers, uh, starting to include Bitcoin mining in the ecosystem. Why would they do that? They would do it because renewables are intermittent power sources, right? Weather, is it sunny or not? Wind, is it windy or not? And Bitcoin mining could take off, if, it's, if there's excess energy uh, uh, from solar being loaded into power walls, it can be offloaded into Bitcoin mining. And the whole ecosystem, therefore, becomes much more economic. If this happens, we believe that the, the uh, adoption of solar is going to accelerate dramatically because there's another profit center associated with it, Bitcoin mining. Well, what happens though in the meantime? So here we are at 35,000, Kathy. Do you think we go much lower from here? Uh, you never know how low is low when a market gets very emotional. Uh, a lot of traders see Bitcoin uh, dropping below the 200-day moving average, uh, which, right. is, which was at 40. Uh, so traders, once that happened, they just dump. Some just uh, dump and run. Uh, I think we're in a capitulation phase. Uh, Yassine has uh, a dashboard. We were looking at all the indicators this morning. They are all suggesting that we are in the capitulation phase phase, which is a really great time to buy, uh, no matter what the asset is. A capitulation phase is buy. It's on sale. Now, am I saying 35000 is the low? You know, if traders, uh, and there are a lot of speculators in, in Bitcoin, if they are uh, running for the hills just because uh, Bitcoin has broken through a moving average that is important to them. It could continue, but uh, all of our indicators are saying this is capitulation right now. Do you have a low point on your model for Bitcoin? 
No, these metrics uh, are, are more a, a measure. Uh, are we in a truly capitulation phase? Okay. And it's very detailed. Yassine uses on-chain analysis, which this is the only asset where you can see exactly who's doing what, when, why, and how. Uh, and all of those metrics are saying, this is a capitulation. This is as, as bad as it got during the coronavirus crisis. So what about systemic concerns? And I'm not talking about bringing down the financial system, but you know more and more of kind of the establishment are getting involved in Bitcoin. A lot more companies have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Should we be concerned about their exposure? Tesla, for one, but others. Yes. Yes. Well, they're usually, in the case of Square and Tesla, they're between five and eight percent of their cash is in uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so... I don't think so. That's no cause for concern. I mean, think about it. We were worried that uh, Tesla would run out of cash. Of course, ARC was not worried, but the world was worried two years ago that it would run out of cash. It has so much cash now that it has the luxury to put five to eight percent in in Bitcoin. So, uh, uh, MicroStrategy is another company. It has almost all its cash in Bitcoin. That's that's mm -hmm. perhaps something. You know, uh, but as I said, if we are in the capitulation uh, phase, we shouldn't be worried about microstrategy either. Uh, I, we do believe this is a new asset class and that institutions, they are looking at it right now because the correlations of relative returns and total returns to compared to other asset classes tends to be very low over time. Uh, and so they have to look at it. Now, ESG might prevent a, a, a move in wholesale, uh, but we do believe that once they understand how renewables are becoming incorporated into the Bitcoin mining ecosystem uh, and that Bitcoin mining might accelerate the adoption of solar, uh, the, right. and I think... And Elon will come back and be a part of that ecosystem as well. So why do you think he came out and said, wait a minute, maybe I'm going to back off of Bitcoin? Um, what do you think his concern was? What was his nervousness? Well, I think he moved in because uh, he's been thinking, watching, like we all have, basically unhinged monetary policies. They're not tied to anything anymore. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is mathematically metered to top out at 21 million units, and we're approaching 19 million now. So the scarcity factor should increase and support the price. We do believe uh, that is what is going to be supporting the price in here. I believe what happened after he took the position in Bitcoin is he got uh, pushback from institutional shareholders like BlackRock. If you've got Larry Fink, you know, beating the drum on climate change as uh, one of the most important uh, topics uh, and problems of our time, uh, then uh, he was going to have to face those sorts of concerns. I don't think he expected that. And uh, now that he's sorting it out, learning more about the environmental impact, I think he'll come back into the mix. We certainly hope he will. Uh, uh, I don't know if he's going to be part of the conference in, in July or not. It would be He would be a very good addition because I think he would provide both sides of the equation. How quickly could the adoption of solar uh, accelerate if we introduce mining into that ecosystem? Do you expect a Bitcoin ETF to get approved anytime soon? And I'm curious if you plan to launch a crypto ETF anytime soon. You know, I think, we, well, now that uh, uh, Gary Gensler is uh, head of the SEC, uh, he's Bitcoin friendly. We know that. He taught a class, uh, uh, courses, at, uh, courses at MIT before coming back to the SEC. So, And I think the research um, uh, professionals uh, at the SEC, uh, they understand Bitcoin in particular and, uh, and I, I think are much more comfortable with it now that we've had several years to digest what exactly it is, go through a bear market, go through a bull market, now go through a bit of a bear market. I think uh, watching uh, the uh, ecosystem evolve and actually become... Uh, even more anti-fragile. You know, we're getting some real tests here. And if the system doesn't break, and I don't think it will, I think that their comfort 
will increase in a couple uh, of ways. Number one, the infrastructure is there, is robust. Number two, the liquidity is there. Uh, I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think that's going to be uh, disproven here. And number three, the price is down from very lofty levels. So, hey, why not start uh, an ETF after a correction in, in the market uh, than before? So I actually think the odds are going up now that we've had this correction. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be this year or not. Uh, we hear perhaps fourth quarter, uh, but you know we heard uh, third quarter before that. So as we get closer to the fourth quarter, we'll know how much is being pushed out. Hey, I want to ask you a little bit more about Tesla. Obviously, you know, you've been out there front and center years ahead when everybody was turning their backs on Tesla, taking another hit. Uh, the news out of China, they have certainly had some tough time. Their growth has slowed substantially. They've had a lot of headaches uh, and, and protests in Shanghai after some accidents with its cars. Is the Chinese market at risk for Tesla? Uh, I, I think the Chinese mar uh, China is going to favor its local producers like Neo and others, Xpeng. Uh, and I think they're granting subsidies to Neo, which is the battery swap company, mm -hmm. even on its very high end cars, which they are not granting to Tesla. So it's obvious and it has always been obvious that China would favor a local producer. But what we are seeing from uh, China uh, and particularly Tesla is exports into Europe. Uh, where it does not yet have a plant. Uh, and what we're hearing is uh, the, uh, especially in Germany, but, but all over Europe, where their, their standards are extremely high for cars in terms of design and performance, uh, that they would prefer cars from Shanghai, which is a much newer plant, and uh, much more productive, much more efficient in terms of uh, these design, perf perfecting these designs, than is Fremont. Uh, and so I think we're seeing a big export market develop uh, from China into Europe. Uh, and uh, I think China will like that. China wants to be known not for shipping or exporting, you know, cheap right. goods, but also high end goods. So this could be the beginning of a trend. So. So is China at risk then for Tesla? I mean, should I, as, I don't think they're going to shut down the factory at all. I think that that okay. factory will be used much more for exporting than we once imagined. I will say that uh, Tesla's cars in, in China uh, have sold very well until very recently. I'm sure the publicity uh, uh, the pub publicity it has received has cooled, cooled uh, uh, Tesla's jets in China, but uh, it's, uh, it's been... Uh, fortuitous that this export market has opened up at the same time. Kat, the one thing I want to ask you, and we talked about it at the beginning, inflation, your mentor, you and I talked about this just a few weeks ago, Art Laffer, you were in your 20s, you know, you were focusing on the economy. It was a time where inflation was off the charts and everybody thought it would consistently stay that way. Laffer thought differently. And we know, well known uh, in the supply side economics, here we are at another time where the markets, the volatility is often guided by our inflation expectations. Is inflation going to be a problem in your view? Well, uh, we, we've been saying for some time, actually since the depths of the coronavirus, we were doing YouTube videos uh, saying regularly, V-shaped recovery, businesses are way behind consumers, consumers are buying all of these goods. In fact, that's all they can do because they're stuck at home, right? So they were buying non-durable and durable goods that could be shipped to them, right? Uh, right. Non Okay, that part of consumption is one third of consumption and a disproportionate amount or percentage of the market basket of consumers was in goods for the past year. Businesses were, didn't expect it. They were behind even before the coronavirus. They had been lagging in terms of capital spending, in terms of inventories. They were worried about inverted yield curves and China-US trade conflict. There were many, many concerns. So they had been dragging their feet. They got even further behind uh, and, and still haven't caught mm -hmm. up. So what's happening now? Double, triple ordering, maybe quadruple ordering, uh, because they just can't get the goods. Panic especially buying. We've been anything. talking about companies panic buying too. 
they're not buying. And so what I believe is we are setting up for a massive period of deflation. Uh, now, let me explain that. Uh, there are three sources of deflation. One is when the orders, these double and triple orders are canceled, right? Now we have seen lumber correct 30% in the last week. I think this is the beginning of that. Copper is now starting to correct. And uh, I, I believe that commodity prices went too far too fast as businesses were scrambling and panicking, right? They were losing business to competition if they hadn't planned their inventories correctly. So that's one source of deflation, but that's only cyclical deflation. And we actually didn't expect it to start now. We expected it to start later in the year, but I guess it makes sense now that vaccines are here and consumers are shifting away from goods towards services or at the margin, uh, the writing is on the wall. The, those are double and triple orders are gonna be canceled, prices were too high, and we're probably gonna see a drop in commodities. But there are two other sources of deflation out there. And this is what we've been saying for quite some time. One has to do with, it's a good deflation. It's caused by, technologically enabled innovation. And we believe when you see DNA sequencing costs uh, dropping 40% for every cumulative doubling in, in genome sequenced, or when you see AI training costs dropping 37 to 50% per year. These are massive deflationary forces that are going to hit every part of the economy. AI is going to be everywhere. So that's good deflation. Now, what's bad deflation? Uh, bad deflation is going to hit those companies that are going to be disintermediated and disrupted by all of the innovation that we talk about all the time based on DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology. So companies who have leveraged up to satisfy by short-term oriented shareholders who say, I want my profits now, I want my dividends now, so they buy back their shares, they haven't been investing enough in innovation. They are gonna lose, if they're not lucky, if, they're, if they are unlucky, they will lose their businesses. So Kathy, what I like about you is your consistency, and we have been talking about these themes, right, for a long time. Having said that, you know your performance has been really consistent. It's been a tougher year this year, and you've had flows out of your funds. I was tracking just, I think, over the last week, it's almost a billion dollars. So, you know, how do you keep your investors kind of energized in your philosophy and your thinking and your outlook uh, and confident in your strategy, you know, in a moment where there's a lot of doubt out there? Yes. Well, uh, a couple of things, just in terms of flows. Uh, in our, our biggest outflows were in March. There were a lot of uh, commentators out there, shall I say, screaming uh, about how ETFs would have to, or our ETFs would have to shut down, which is impossible. And they just don't understand the ETF uh, infrastructure surrounding us, um, it's a beautiful thing, let me tell you. The, the flows are no problem, our spreads have not moved. But anyway, be, beyond that, um, what has happened is our price targets for the next five years, that's our investment time horizon, have not changed, right? Uh, at but all, at not at all, yeah. Not, in fact, some of them have gone up as quarterly results have come out. Now, they're not going to change that much because that one quarter's result is not going to change a five-year price target by that much. Uh, but the forces that the coronavirus put in motion, supporting all of the innovation uh, that in which we invest, they are not, they are not looking back. Uh, and so what we are seeing is you know, a 30 to 40% discount to peak prices in, in February uh, for the same price targets. Uh, so we're looking at this saying, all right, on sale, innovation is on sale. And oh, by the way, the bull market has broadened out. It has, it is now embracing value and more cyclical stocks. So what has happened is the bull market has broadened, has strengthened, and that is using usually a launching pad for our next move up. This happened, well, if I can just say, 2016, same thing. 
Fourth quarter of 16, after Trump, against all expectations, was elected, uh, uh, value stocks took off because we we're going to have a big cycle, tax cuts, right? And our strategy went down. We were negative. Uh, but what happened was 2017 was one of our best years ever, save last year. Uh, and that's because the bull market had broadened out, included value, cyclicals were taking off, and uh, the economy was on the mend. Our economy is very strong right now. And cyclical earnings growth and revenue growth is a competition to innovation. But if we're right on what's happening with commodity prices right now, uh, and that's going to be extended, that is the ticket to the next move in our kinds of stocks. Well, it's interesting, too. What about, though, the tech underperformance, Kathy, that we've seen? How much longer do you think, you know, we see that? Well, you can never say when we've hit bottom. I mean, I can tell you uh, that the valuations in, in, our, in, in our portfolios would suggest uh, that over the next five years, again, if our research is correct, no promises, uh, we believe that our portfolios will more than triple over the next five years. So that's more than a 25% compound annual rate of return over the next five years. Actually, it's approaching 30 after today. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking at that with great confidence because these innovation platforms have hit escape velocity and they there is no turning back. There is no turning back because they are uh, helping businesses uh, and consumers back to the uh, old world. There we go. Little free Sorry? There we go. You're back. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Oh. You're freezing up. Go ahead, please. I'm oh, sorry. We, we're not going back to the old world. We're not going back oh. to the old world. So, so uh, you know, my confidence has only increased in our strategies. Can I ask you, why did you guys get out of Apple, your position in so Apple? Okay, what we do when a bull market is as extended as, as the move into our type of stock was, is as that move happens, we start uh, in oh, We're freezing up a little bit. Let's see if we can get Kathy back. Uh, Sorry. There you go. Here That's okay. So Innovation, it's happening, but not always when it comes to the, the virtual yeah. <laughs> conversation. Go ahead. You were talking yeah. about Apple. So Apple was one of our cash-like instruments. It's an innovative company. Uh, it's in, uh, in, in the innovation zone, but its characteristics are very defensive. So we will add names like Apple, the fangs, Apple, Google, Facebook. We will add those, uh, add to those positions uh, or even reintroduce those stocks as a bull market, our, our portfolios were up 150%. We knew there was going to be a correction, and we just wanted to have very liquid stocks. Apple is a great company. It's going to do fine. Uh, uh, it's a fang. It's in a lot of portfolios. Uh, we are all about the next fangs, but we will use the existing fangs. If you see, they are acting very defensively. Mm -hmm become a defensive group. So we will fold them in, increase them uh, when we see a move like we saw last year. When we see a decline, like the one we're seeing now, we're seeing much higher returns from the other stocks in our portfolio. You know, you were talking about um, kind of value and cyclical, and I, I'm curious, are there any value and cyclical strategies right now that you guys have identified as ones you want to pursue? Well, in our... Uh, space strategy, A ARKX, you'll find a lot of value-oriented stocks. Uh, many people are surprised to see deer, for example, in there. And what they don't understand is thanks to satellite technology and, uh, and and uh, the, the increase in the number of satellites out there and the, and the precision that we're getting from them, uh, we are now uh, enabling precision agriculture with autonomous tractors and drones. So it, it, without, without that constellation out there, that would not be happening. We think the, the two biggest applications or, or uh, beneficiaries uh, of the space race uh, are mm -hmm. satellites, 
going to enable mobile connectivity or connectivity around the world, broadband connectivity. It is really hard for us to imagine that 3 billion people in the world have no access to the internet or broadband. Uh, this is going to enable that, satellites and also farming. Uh, and the other thing we think is, is going to happen much sooner than space uh, tourism, or, or it'll be a much bigger deal in terms of revenue generation, is hypersonic flight. So any aerospace space company focused on hypersonic flight we're interested in. And they tend to be value have, stocks. You mentioned earlier, there have been people who have been very vocal and public fans of you, and then some now have become your critics, or they criticize, you know, having a younger investment and, you know, group of um, analysts, your analyst team. What do you say to them? I would say that's our secret weapon. Those analysts have their, uh, their education and their feet in the new world. The most seasoned analysts, healthcare analysts on Wall Street, and God bless them, they've been great at what they do. Anything, they know all the code words and how to decipher them from the FDA, but they probably haven't experimented with CRISPR gene editing like our genomic uh, analysts have. And they don't have advanced degrees in cognitive computing, including bringing behavioral science into it. So uh, many of our analysts are coming to us directly from college and they are fully equipped uh, with domain expertise in a way that most analysts out there, again, very seasoned, are not just because they didn't go to school and haven't been exposed to these new technologies. Now, I know there are a lot of PhDs out there and they of course know a lot, but I would put any of our analysts uh, up against the most seasoned analysts on the street when it comes to the topic of innovation and new technologies, right? That's our focus. And so why wouldn't we? I think we have a competitive advantage for a few reasons. Number one, our analysts, their domain expertise. Uh, number two, uh, our, uh, their willingness to engage with the communities out there through social media and give our research right. away not when it's finished, but as it's evolving so that they can uh, communicate and engage with the innovators themselves. Uh, so I think we have a competitive dynamic uh, unmatched out there in the industry. Hey, just to wrap up, Kathy, uh, and you've been, you and I have been talking for a, for a lot of years. This has kind of been a year that's unusual, I would, I would say, in some regards for you. What have you learned in the past year and, and what does maybe change mean to you? Well, as we were having such a, an incredible year last year, and I do think the coronavirus crisis caused it, innovation sol solves problems. I kept saying to everyone, this will not everyone in the company, we must stay humble. We must stay humble and we must, we, we know this is going to come to an end. We're going to go through a, a severe correction and we have to just keep our, our heads down, focused on our research to, uh, to keep our conviction and, uh, and, and drive our strategies forward. That's what's happened, keeping our heads down hopefully staying humble and uh, really trying to educate people. The great opportunities available out there, get on the right side of change. This is going to be the most uh, uh, amazing period of my investment career. And I've been through 40 plus years uh, because we've never seen five innovation platforms evolve at the same time, all of them leading to exponential growth trajectories that are going to transform people's lives. And so I say just, you know, uh, uh, read our research, uh, uh, talk to our analysts on Twitter if you really want to learn more, and, and, uh, and join the ride because we believe it's going to be magnificent. Just quickly from the audience, do you ever get recognized in public like a celebrity? Some people liken you to Warren Buffett, and do you ever miss kind of your pre-rock star days, just quickly? Um, the answer is yes, to much to my surprise, uh, even in uh, an island off of New Zealand, which is what? Uh, but, uh, and no, I, we are honored and, and delighted because you know what, uh, and I know it's been hard for uh, our, our clients in recent months, keep the faith, uh, but, uh, 
many people's lives have been changed by what happened last year. They they put their uh, they allocated resources towards our strategies, towards Bitcoin, and uh, and they had a magnificent run. So it's gratitude that we feel. Now, of course, we're feeling very responsible, of course, this year. And but that's why it's so important for us to say, you know, that what pains me more than anything as a portfolio manager is when I know our clients are selling at the bottom. Uh, and it usually is that people sell. The big capitulation that I described earlier with Bitcoin is selling at mm -hmm. the bottom. So, so you make a terrible mistake and you don't want to ever get in again. And it just pains me. So I'm just praying that we don't have a lot of that. We've had a lot of retention. Uh, just to correct one thing you said at the beginning, uh, actually, as a firm, we've not had one month of redemptions. The ETF platform had, if you go month end to month end, which is how we measure this sort of thing, right. uh, our redemptions in March were 500 million. We, uh, we had, uh, we, we've had positive flows in April, May, it remains to be seen. It's been nip and tuck. It may end up being a, a small, uh, depends on what happens in these last few weeks. But, you know, if there's real capitulation, sure, we could have a big outflow, but I think that's capitulation.